Uh, so we're going to do a little introduction on the supercluster. Uh, as Mishka said, just feel, feel free to add questions on the chat box as we go through it. So maybe by way of background, I think some of you are more uh, familiar with superclusters than others. So I'm just going to go through a bit of the thought process that led to the creation of the superclusters. Uh, so, you know, uh, I think for many of the folks that have been in the innovation game for some time, you know that we've been working hard to try to make Canada one of the top innovation destinations. We've got fantastic startups. We've got a great community in all, many areas of the country. But even when you look at the overall innovation scorecard, we're still ranking 12 out of 16 countries on a recent OECD scorecard. We still have many, many companies that are small, uh, looking to grow, but uh, for now remain uh, quite small in its design, less than 10 employees. And uh, unfortunately, when we're small, uh, it, it creates uh, greater pressures around um, how, how the longevity plays out. So an awful lot of our companies don't make it uh, over the long term. And I think when we kind of look at the, um, the other consequence of this, it's really about making us more competitive. So on average, larger businesses tend to be more productive and they tend to kind of uh, attract more capital. That's what we want with our startup communities to really be able to scale up. Mishka, if you could turn to the next slide. So uh, for many of us who've worked in digital, we know that we're on the onset of, of, a, of the next generation of, of where data is taking us. So often coined as the fourth industrial revolution, it really kind of signals the change in the industry structure, how the economy will work, and it's the introduction of new technologies that are going to forever shape uh, a new regime. It includes areas like artificial intelligence, quantum computing, many of the areas that uh, will be automated around robotics. And uh, even in, in the life sciences arena, it will be genomics and data that will drive an awful lot of the next uh, successes. Can we move to the next slide, please? So uh, the global data opportunity, I think, for, for most that have been in this have, have kind of seen and witnessed the, the rise of a lot of companies who've taken advantage of this trend. There's been more data that's been created in the past few years than the entire history of the previous uh, human race, the history of the human race. Um, in a couple of years, I think the IP and internet traffic is going to be uh, about 150 gigabits per second. And within five years, it's going to be over 70 billion smartphones. All of these are, are, are indicating that um, the importance of data has, has really sort of uh, exacerbated the challenges that we have and how we shape our economy. Next slide, please. I think the prediction is that uh, over the next several years, enterprises are going to spend over $2 trillion on digital, digital transformation. We're already seeing that with uh, the COVID crisis as to the pace at which this is moving. So an awful lot of industries who would have been looking to wait uh, for some time, I think, have been forced into this realm of looking how digital can transform their businesses. Next slide, please. So for us, I think we're among five superclusters. As Mishka said from the outset, uh, each of the superclusters has a slightly different focus area. You see our sister organizations in the prairies that are focused on protein industries. Uh, there's the manufacturing supercluster in Ontario. There's a scale AI, which is a um, uh, artificial intelligence uh, supercluster focused on supply chain AI. And then of course, in your backyard, the ocean supercluster in Atlantic Canada. For all of us, if we move to the next slide, we have a, a set of common goals. It really is about building success around powerful partnerships and alliances, really trying to create innovation uh, at a scale that can actually bring together different partners and um, different uh, expertise into these arenas. Uh, the second area is really to kind of build on the diversity and breadth of the talent, and in, in part is to equip ourselves for what the digital economy is going to demand. Uh, thirdly, it's about uh, providing the supports necessary to scale up the uh, small and mid-sized businesses, many of which are the, innovate, uh, are the innovation backbone for the country. And uh, lastly, it's also to ensure that we have products and uh, technology platforms that are truly globally competitive. So those, I think, are quite consistent across all the superclusters in Canada. Mishka, can you move to the next slide, please? So now I'm going to turn our attention more specifically to the things that we're doing as a digital supercluster. And I'll start uh, first and foremost with, with uh, the purpose that we defined uh, for ourselves. 
So it really is about unlocking the potential of the innovation that already exists in Canada, and particularly the digital innovation to lead the world to, to try to create these, um, these uh, team structures, these collaborations, uh, because it's through those collaborations that we can build new products and ultimately have solutions that can lead uh, in the global stage. Next slide, please. So we, ha we form the uh, supercluster here with some core beliefs. In fact, we have a set of values and a charter of values that all of our members actually sign off on. But some of the key things that we focus on is around diversity. The diversity piece being not only in terms of the representation ar across projects, but also the types of expertise, uh, the different sides of organizations, the different, different backgrounds and, and uh, expertise areas that, that actually bring together uh, opportunities that no single organization could do on its own. You know, the second element to our belief system is that we believe in radical collaboration. It really is about harnessing um, that diversity piece and uh, through that collaboration to unleash the ambition that, that I think is, is resonant there, but ultimately, uh, perhaps we didn't have the scale and scope to do so, but by building these collaborations, we can actually achieve much greater outcomes. And finally, it's about the ambition. And the ambition, I think, has always been there. It's been a latent part of having the resources necessary, but it's something that we can amplify as a result of the supercluster. Next slide, please. Uh, so there are some key goals to what we're trying to do in all of our projects and programs. Uh, first and foremost, as I mentioned, uh, is really about research and development that's done out of collaboration. Uh, the second area is really attaching these collaborative R&D projects to real-world customers. So part of the exercise in our supercluster, and I think for most superclusters, is to tie in the adoption mechanisms such that every project already has uh, wired into it a market receptor capacity. So someone who's able to kind of uh, invest in the project, but also adopt it on the other side. Next slide, please. So we do have a few areas of focus. I think up until the COVID uh, uh, situation arose, we really had uh, three core technology areas and one in the ecosystem building area. So where we started from a couple of years ago was to design our programs around building common infrastructure, which is uh, our data commons program, uh, building uh, digital twins or replicas, digital replicas of real world environments using augmented and virtual reality and having um, laneways to uh, really create the conditions for more digital health uh, capabilities and uh, precision health in general is really about innovations that can tie to the specifics of an individual's wellness. And that includes areas like early diagnosis, it includes uh, use of technologies around virtual care and personalized treatment. So that was really the core and crux of what we had started with. The capacity building program is really something that uh, is, is built around this idea that beyond individual projects that there could be a spillover effect in terms of the benefits to the broader ecosystem. And that's partnering with uh, organizations on a more uh, broad basis to ensure that we have uh, training capacity, skills development, and we have the ability to bring in um, segments of the population who are typically underrepresented when it comes to the digital economy. So a lot of that really is partnering with organizations like Venn and many others to ensure that we have some ability to deliver on a mandate that's broader than individual R&D projects. And uh, more recently, we announced the COVID-19 program. This was in late March, and it was in direct response to the crisis that I think we've all been living under. Um, ultimately, the COVID-19 program, which you can find out more about on our website, is really about digital innovations that are going to help with the near-term response efforts on COVID-19, but ultimately also help us to steer uh, the conditions necessary to get back to life and work and all the things that um, we, we knew well before the COVID crisis, but we will probably need some safeguards uh, fueled by technology, uh, enabled by sort of um, uh, platforms and products that uh, give the assurances necessary for us to do that safely. So there's a number of different areas on the COVID-19 program, which I'm more than happy to address in the Q&A portion of the session. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so for us, I think all of this has led to um, a tremendous 
uh, outpouring of support from many, many members across the country. I think uh, for us, we now have uh, close to 600 organizations actually from a wide spectrum of backgrounds, whether they're your startup organizations, we have many that are Canadian SMEs, larger companies, we have industrial leaders that are customers, uh, we have multinational companies that also serve as customers and uh, uh, co-development partners, universities, research organizations, colleges, not-for-profits, government agencies. And you see on the right-hand side all the logos of the roughly uh, 600 organizations that are part of our, our, our full member base, there's a collection who have signed up that have moved beyond the associate level into full membership. And that's, uh, that's what's illustrated on the right. I'm going to explain a little bit about the difference between being a member and associate in a, in a slide to follow. Next slide, please. So just to give you a sense, although we we're headquartered in British Columbia, we now have members, we're quite fortunate that we have members that are across the country. Uh, we have members in, um, uh, across the prairies, uh, Ontario and Quebec, and uh, of late, uh, we're really pleased to see we have a growing number of members that are signing up across Atlantic Canada. My hope is as a result of this meeting and this information session that we can encourage more of you to sign up to be part of our supercluster and to help us with our ambitions around creating uh, really innovative R&D projects uh, that, can get, that can involve innovators from across the country. Next slide, please. So uh, I mentioned earlier that our community consists of members and associates. So of the, of the close to 600 organizations, we have about 50 or so that are members. These are, these are organizations who have been successful in projects and have made an explicit commitment to invest in projects, putting in uh, the equivalent of sort of uh, of investment dollars in some cases. In many cases, it's about uh, labor materials or in-kind sort of investments into projects. Uh, and uh, that combined with the investments that we make, uh, the co-investments that we make, that's what fuels the development uh, of, of new initiatives. So members are, are those that are actually participating through investments directly into projects. Associates uh, and we have many of them, are really organizations that are either supporting members in making those projects re a reality, or they're exploring different project opportunities that they can get involved with. And ultimately, through successful projects, they will upgrade their status from associates into membership. Associates is a, is a category which is free to join, and I'll, I'll, I'll share that with you. But you get access to all of our uh, resources so that you can actually create the kind of projects and initiatives that you're interested in, meet with other members, build the, the kind of profile of, of, of capabilities that you're most interested in driving your business on. But ultimately, uh, if you're successful in projects, then we encourage and invite uh, associates to become members. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, I'm going to pause after this slide and then we'll have a chance to answer some questions that are probably on the chat board there. Um, so the way our, our membership model works is that membership is open to all Canadian organizations. Uh, the, the key, I think, for everyone to be successful is to start by joining as an associate. You can do that on our website. It's free to join. There aren't any obligations other than for you to sign on to our charter of values, our code of conduct, which basically reiterates the, many of the values that we outlined at the very beginning and gives the template by which um, organizations work with one another and kind of sets a framework for that. Uh, after joining as an associate, we give you uh, all the access to the tools that are necessary to build collaborations, meet other members. Of course, ordinarily, we'd be able to do a lot of this stuff in person. Uh, but the reality is now we're, we're exploring how digital tools and digital interactions such as this can be used to get people familiar with one another and ultimately look at the program areas that are of greatest interest to us and also some of the projects that are already up and running to see how people can actually contribute more to those outcomes. Uh, the key to success, of course, is really about uh, the projects themselves. So. What we're, what we're asking uh, folks to do is, is to lean in by developing or proposing projects in each of the program areas that are outlined. In some cases, is adding expertise to 
uh, areas that others may be already thinking about. In other cases, it's, it's actually having your organization lead projects and maybe bring collaborators along with you. Um, once those projects, and it got, does go through a selection process, once they're selected and ratified by the supercluster, then we invite associates who were previously, uh, uh, you know, remaining sort of as, as, uh, as free members to upgrade to full members. And when they're full members, it gives them all the rights and privileges associated with helping to run the organization. Ultimately, the, the supercluster is a member-driven uh, and member-run organization where all the statutes of the organization are set up by members through these membership agreements. They sit on the board, they govern the strategy of the supercluster, and that's what uh, upgrading to full membership uh, entails and provides uh, access to. And of course, uh, this is all about a repetition exercise of continuing to build on success. And so joining our community means that there's a long, uh, long-term long view to repeating the engagement and the success and continue to build out successful projects as a result. So uh, Mishka, maybe I, I can turn to the chat window for a moment and let's see if we've got some questions that uh, people have put up so far. Feel free to ask them if you have. Oh, here we go. Hi, Bill. Are you interested in reviewing proposals on ecosystem building projects to create new startup companies wrapped around existing dormant IP sitting on government shelves in Canada and the USA? Well, that's a rather specific question. So maybe that's something that you can email me afterwards. I would say that the um, capacity building projects so far have really taken the flavor of building capacity around training and development. So in particular, skills development uh, in various facets, uh, uh, areas like reskilling of existing workforces, um, areas where we're trying to get more uh, women and indigenous uh, uh, community members into the digital economy, uh, areas in which we maybe need specialized expertise around data science, artificial intelligence, and that sort of thing. That being said, it's not that we haven't or aren't looking at uh, areas of, of investment beyond that, but uh, I, I think your question is quite specifically, we're gonna have a conversation uh, separately on that. Okay. In order to apply for the COVID project, I was told I needed to find an associate or member. Curious how that works. Well, actually the best way to go about it is just to sign up as an associate. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, it's open to any Canadian organization. So go through that process. And uh, our, our requirement is actually, so becoming an associate means that you can be the one that leads the project. But what we look for is that you can bring along collaborators into that exercise as well. So uh, what, we, what we tend to favor are projects in which there are more than one organization involved in developing a successful outcome on the project. And uh, where it really matters is uh, if you have target customers or identified uh, market adopters on the end of it, that's really going to help in the COVID response uh, projects in particular, because we are trying to get to outcomes that are easily deployable. So not just technology for the sake of that technology, but uh, outcomes that actually will matter in the response, which means that there's um, customers and uh, adopters on the end of that project. Okay. Hi, Bill. Is there going to be a permanent representation for the supercluster here in the region through Venn or another partner? Yeah, that's a good question. I think all of the superclusters have, have been trying to think through what does regional representation look like for us. Uh, we're not alone. I think if we speak to our friends at Oceans, uh, you know, they have the same request that comes from uh, players out in BC. So uh, we don't have a good answer for you, but we certainly will try to work through partner organizations like Ben and others to see how we can uh, build community and build collaborations. I think uh, in the end, it probably doesn't um, quite fit for us to have offices across the country, but we may do it through partners like that. Great, and we have one last question right now. I joined NGEN. Is this a different membership as I represent a digital solution delivered globally around the world for digital transformation? Uh, that's a good question. So each of the superclusters is a separate organization. Uh, it has its own uh, incorporation with its own membership structure. 
so as we've said to all the members and associates that are part of the digital supercluster, we encourage them to join whatever superclusters make sense for them to join. So if you've joined NGEN, that's terrific. If you're interested in joining us as well, we certainly would welcome it. And uh, I think the nature of the projects in each supercluster are different. The collaborators are different. Uh, and the customers, particularly the industry partners, are quite different. So in the NGEN one, you're really looking at applications that tie ultimately to a manufacturing type of customer base. For us, our customer bases tend to be in the natural resources, healthcare, and industrial segments. Uh, in scale AI's case, you're really looking at customers that are much more tied to supply chain. So in each case, there's a different sort of framework for how these collaborations and projects would work. And if it makes sense for your digital platform to be in more than one supercluster, then I certainly would encourage you to do so. Uh, do you have, oh yes, we will be making the presentation available afterwards, uh, both the presentation and the recording. Uh, David says, thanks for that answer about engine. We'll join immediately as this makes most sense. Okay, terrific. Um, any other questions, Nishka, or should I car carry on in the presentation? Uh, not right now. I think you can carry on. Okay, why don't I move to the next slide then? Uh, so one of the aspects uh, once uh, once you have joined is that you'll get access to a whole range of uh, supports that we provide. Uh, ordinarily, we'd have a lot of events. Of course, they're more digital in nature, such as what we're doing. But those events are really uh, the pathway to networking and connecting with the customers that are part of the supercluster. Uh, also, the needs that they might express. It's uh, finding other collaborators that you might work with. And really what we found is those are really the ignition points for building uh, really solid ideas and concepts. So the connections piece, there's a couple different ways to do that. Uh, once you've signed up, there's access to a member resource portal, which uh, provides a member directory where you can kind of search out all the other folks that are part of the Supercluster membership. Of course, uh, as, as you look across that, you can search for expertise. And if you also have partners that you'd like to bring into the Supercluster, encourage them to join as well. And I think that that's how we can build more robustness in some of the collaborations. The resource portal, in addition to having a member directory, also has access to um, an ideation hub, which uh, is really a digital representation of the whiteboarding capabilities that you would normally have in a live uh, workshop or ideation forum. Uh, but we also have uh, capabilities in the resource portal to give you uh, tips and tricks on how you're building out your proposals, all the guidelines, the co-investment uh, information, and some of the policies that are, are quite important in terms of how we actually uh, make decisions on projects uh, that's all embedded in our resource portal. Uh, ultimately, all these resources are there for one reason. It's to help our members and our associates get to successful projects. So all of this is really just uh, the foundational pieces that allow you to do so. Next slide, please. Uh, so I want to give an example of what a successful consortium or partnership would look like. So uh, typically uh, in, in, in the framework that we operate on, there is an industry partner or a customer. Ultimately, they're the ones that are going to adopt the solution. But why it's important is that we're trying to build the bridge to say that it's a product that someone's going to uh, take on. And that's going to give the core reference uh, customer that you're going to need to then be able to sell it over and over and over again, not only in Canada, but in, in many other places around the world. Now, part of that exercise is to partner up an industry lead with a technology partner. So this is a product or platform company who typically is as much of the baseline capability as to try to build this uh, uh, capability set, but they'll bring into that mix co-development partners who may have specialized expertise in particular areas. Uh, that combined with tech, technical service providers, so there might be integrators in there, there might be um, uh, custom development houses, uh, and all of that is important because as you build solutions with various components, it all has to come together into a, a, a final solution. Uh, in, in, in our projects, we insist on having a post-secondary research partner. This is how we ensure that there's a link back to the commercialization stack and objectives for universities. So back to the question earlier about trying to take uh, maybe resident IP or research that's been done in the laboratory uh, setting 
and bringing it forward and pulling it into projects. That's really what we're trying to do there. And the digital supercluster is ultimately a co-funder in this. So we're putting in money and, and dollars a, against the investments that are being made by everyone else in this. So ultimately, by putting additional dollars on the table and being also able to leverage the investments from each of these different partners in this project, uh, any single organization is able to kind of realize a larger investment pool as a result of that leverage. And also, in some cases, that helps them to buy down the risk associated with uh, executing on the project. Or in some cases, it's about making the project bigger than it otherwise would have been uh, if it was just a single organization. So let me give you an example of what that actually looks like in a real practical sense. If we go to the next slide. So here's a project example. Uh, one of the projects that we funded uh, about a year and a half ago. It's a predictive analytics uh, project for, for industrial manufacturing. So the industry partner in this case is Avcorp. Avcorp is a mid-sized uh, manufacturing company based in, um, in uh, British Columbia. They do aerospace component parts for uh, large aircraft uh, aerospace uh, manufacturing companies like Bombardier, like um, Airbus, and uh, Boeing. Uh, you know, for them, a lot of the uh, process design is based on uh, next generation materials. So they're looking at composite materials. And so the technology company in this case was D-Wave. D-Wave was, is, uh, I think, the first commercial quantum computing company. So in the quantum computing space, uh, one of the key capabilities for quantum computers is to be able to solve uh, what we'll characterize as probabilistic problems. Uh, so one of the aspects of having uh, a, a company like Alcorp that does uh, industrial manufacturing using composite materials is that when you deal with composites, you're really looking for uh, where there might be a small variation in that composite material where it could be fractions of a millimeter in, in difference or a slight imperfection in that material. And so over a large, uh, over a large wingspan, that, that could be uh, quite significant in terms of the overall area, what you're trying to do is build a predictive engine as to where you're going to see fault in that manufacturing process. So that's what this project is all about. And in order to do that, D-Wave had to partner with a small startup company that could actually deliver algorithms that were based on what they called sparse information or sparse data. And that's a company out of Toronto called Solid State AI. Uh, SFU, uh, so Simon Fraser University based in Vancouver, has a lot of the data science capabilities and was doing research in this area. And then we are a co-investor in this equation. So this is the combination of different expertise areas that came together on a project that we launched about 18 months ago. And it really is designed to help to perfect the industrial manufacturing process for aerospace parts. Next slide, please. So I think that kind of takes us to the, to the end here. Um, we certainly look forward to having more Atlantic Canada companies and organizations join our supercluster. I think uh, everything that uh, you'll need to find is on our website. There's a join page and fairly straightforward process. As I mentioned, we ask all of our new associates to sign on to our uh, participation agreement, which really ensures that everyone understands the code of conduct and and uh, is a signatory to our uh, core values and our charter values. And then uh, once you've signed up, uh, then we provide you with all the resource tools that are necessary to help you get involved and engaged. And uh, maybe at that, I'll turn back to you, Mishka, and see if there's any other questions. Uh, hello, do the various superclusters overlap funding opportunities? For example, if you have a project that might apply across engine, digital, and scale AI, will each supercluster collaborate with you together, or are you restricted to only one supercluster at a time? Uh, that's a great question. Um, I think we're starting to do more uh, co-funding exploration amongst uh, multiple superclusters. We've had to do that in the context of COVID. Uh, before that, it would have been the case that the projects would have been more standalone because as I mentioned, the industry partners were different. And uh, 
but I do think that there will be going forward more projects which uh, can be proposed um, where there might be more than one supercluster that can help to uh, co-fund that initiative. Uh, just as a, a point of reference, uh, the superclusters get together on a weekly basis to kind of talk about uh, what's happening in each of our respective areas and uh, projects are discussed uh, amongst our CTOs as part of that process as well. So there's good visibility in terms of looking at where the synergies are and we'll certainly work towards uh, uh, building a framework where multiple superclusters can ultimately invest in something that looks like it could be bigger. Hi, who owns the intellectual property? Do the supercluster or leading partners claim the IP? Yeah, so in, in our case, uh, and I think in the case of most superclusters, the idea of um, the initiative is to ensure that it remains industry-led. And that, that says that you have to have rules around IP that are consistent with that idea that we want to build more IP for the benefit of, of industry leaders in order to commercialize those successes. For us and all of our supercluster projects, we do not own IP. Uh, the IP is owned by the consortium and the project. Um, in fact, in every project, we have a requirement that the project and the consortium outline their IP strategy, who's going uh, who's to bring in what, and uh, how that's going to be shared. In, in some cases, it's fairly straightforward that if um, a company has an existing product, they're bringing that in as background IP for the project. There's no contesting the ownership of that, but they are contributing it to the benefit of that project. And the team itself, the project team, with, with our help and guidance, will negotiate well, what happens to a rising IP or IP that's developed as a result of the project. In some cases, you know, the parties with, uh, across the project will determine that it belongs to a particular party and that there's a license arrangement to all the others. Or in the cases where there's brand new IP, there might be some other sharing of that IP that's determined explicitly by that consortium. So what the supercluster's role in that is to be a facilitator to help with those conversations such that a good uh, foundational structure can be built inside the project. So Amos has just a quick follow-up question to that as well, uh, same person. Uh, he's looking to understand what exactly he should give for the investment. So in our, uh, we have a co-investment guide that actually uh, stipulate sort of what the investments need to be in a project. So for smaller organizations, actually, uh, typically the mix is cash. Uh, it, it could be salaries, which is in lieu of cash. Uh, and there are some limits in terms of what is acceptable in terms of in-kind contributions towards projects. So as you work through the templates associated with doing a project proposal, you'll actually see that there are budget guidelines and co-investment guidelines that you'll refer to. Uh, I, would, I would suggest that if you're a small company, in most cases are smaller companies, uh, which now comprise more than 60% uh, of our membership, uh, roughly half of all the investments into projects. For the most part, smaller companies have tended to contribute salaries uh, in lieu of cash as their investments into projects. Uh, in some cases, it's actual cash, but in most cases, it's really salaries in lieu of cash. We have another question about the recording and presentation uh, and where it's going to be hosted. I can follow up with an email with a link to the recording and the PDF uh, version of this document. It will live on Vin's YouTube channel, and I believe you plan to put it on your website, Bill? Uh, why don't we send out that information with a follow-up to everybody afterwards? Okay, so we will follow up with you. Um, the next question, can government funding be used for members' financial contribution? Uh, well, that, that's a difficult question because it depends on where the government dollars are coming from. There are some stacking rules associated with uh, projects, and I think that applies universally for all government programs. Uh, the stacking rule being simply that um, you know, a project can't receive more than 100% from various uh, government sources. If you're getting dollars uh, invested in your project through IRAP, um, but you're using those, uh, you know, provided there isn't an over, is not an overlap in terms of what you're trying to do in our project versus what you're trying to do in the IRAP project. Um, if you have funds available through other pieces that you want to invest into this project, 
I don't see an issue, but I think a lot of that comes down to the interpretation exercise that we do when we go through budgets with you. What is the total size of your membership and what portion is SME solution provider? So I'd actually break it out a little bit more than that. So I mentioned that in the successful projects that we have, of which we now have close to 30 projects, 60% uh, of the participants in those projects are SMEs. Uh, probably about 25% of it are larger companies. And so SMEs are by far and away the largest representative group within the projects that have been selected. Across the membership, it's probably uh, SMEs dominate. Uh, I would say it's likely more than 80% of our membership. Does anyone else have any other questions that they'd like to type in the chat box? Okay. If not, then uh, I think the next step would be for those that are interested, join our community and, um, and be part of the supercluster. Uh, once you have joined, I should mention that we, we typically have a deeper dive in terms of what it means to be an associate. We have our onboarding sessions to help you get started. Um, but I want to thank all of you again for joining us today and uh, learning more about the Supercluster. Bill, would you be comfortable if I shared your email? I think just to help us a little bit with it, if you could, because uh, we get it all directed to an inbox that three of us can actually manage. It's okay. at info at info at digital supercluster.ca. Perfect. I can include that in the follow up email as well. Perfect. Uh, we have a thank you message for the presentation. It was very great introduction to this organization. Thank you. Well, if there's no more questions, then um, I guess that's it. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. If you have any questions, um, feel free to reach out to me. Feel free to reach out to the Digital Technology Supercluster. Again, I will be following up with an email with the link to the recording and the presentation and any email addresses that would be of use. Um, I hope you all have a wonderful day. Thank you so much, Bill. Thank you so much to your team. We appreciate your time. And I hope everyone has a wonderful day. Bye. Thanks very much.